oh everybody as folks start to uh to trickle in uh we are going to give everyone probably like a minute or two um to get in before we start to get things kicked off uh but what i am going to ask of everyone is uh gonna ask for uh i guess two questions uh everyone should have access to the chat um and so if in the chat uh curious one where is everybody located physically right now and then the other thing i'm curious about is uh and i've asked this before jeff you've done other panels with us so maybe you've answered this before is what is your favorite m m flavor all right those two questions where are you at physically what's your favorite m m uh and i am in i'm in madison wisconsin area uh a cheese head where it is currently uh currently snowing and cold I'm seeing some comments in the chat is disabled, Matt. Oh, okay, let me go and let me go and make sure that we can enable that. In the meantime, for panelists, uh, why don't we uh, kind of share what our, uh, where you all are located and uh, what your favorite m, m is as well. I am currently in London. I've never been asked my favorite m, &M flavor, but I love the classics. Just a good, good old chocolate m, m Oh yeah, just the milk chocolate. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, keep it simple. All right, I can support that. <laughs> I'm in Los Angeles, uh, where it is a blustery 70 degrees. And uh, I'll go with the uh, crunchy peanut. L love a little texture. There you go. Um, I can go next. Uh, I'm in Richmond, California, where it's right in the middle, 50 degrees. And uh, I'm a peanut peanut butter M and M guy. Nice. All right, Eric. I'm with uh, I'm with you, my friend. I'm a peanut butter I'm a peanut butter guy uh, myself. So I like to hear that, Jen. I don't think you've gone yet. No, Jen. I am dialing in from Bushwick in Brooklyn. Uh, not warm. Um, it's so funny when you asked that, Matt. I thought you meant which color because there's been all the drama around the color, and I was like very upset ah. at the question because I don't know if anybody's seen. <laughs> That M Ms came out with a female only M M packaging where they have the like female M Ms, and ah. I just I am just not understanding the branding behind that. Uh -huh. uh, so I'm like kind of struggling with M Ms. Yeah, right now. Um, yeah I, I support that as well. We're definitely yeah. not. Yeah, we're not going. We're not going that route. We're looking for for flavor. I like flavor the mini here. ones in the tube. Yeah, yeah. nice. Yeah, for me, the peanut butter thing does it just because it's like, I mean, it's basically like a spoonful of peanut butter and Nutella, like kind of wrapped in one. Um, yes, I have done that before, full full disclosure. Uh, if you haven't, you should try it, but uh, you know, don't do not do it too much. Um, all right, so we are, we're three minutes past the hour. Let's go ahead and get things uh, kind of kicked off here with uh, with the group. So. Welcome everybody to the expert roundtable session that we have today, where we are going to be talking about everyone's uh, or a lot of people's favorite topic, which is uh, RevOps and go-to-market technology, specifically how to build the ideal go-to-market tech stack or uh, optimize, make the one that you currently have better. And so uh, to get things kicked off, let me first go around the horn and do some introductions of the, the group that we have here. So first off, I want to introduce Jen, who is the CEO of GoNimbly. GoNimbly is a leading RevOps consultancy, and a lot of their clients are large enterprise SaaS businesses. So Jen brings tons of unique uh, kind of perspective to the table. Also, fun fact that I learned about Jen last week when we were planning about this is that on the side, she designs board games, um, so, uh, which I absolutely love. So Jen, thank you for being here. Uh, next up, we have Eric, who is the director of RevOps at DemoStack. Uh, Eric has actually had the chance to build his tech stack essentially from scratch at DemoStack. And then the other interesting aspect is DemoStack is demo software. Uh, which is also a part of the go-to-market tech stack or a growing part of uh, go-to-market tech stacks that you're now seeing. So uh, definitely uh, one of the uh, unicorns in the RevOps space uh, with Eric. So Eric, thank you for uh, thank you for being here as well. And then I also have Jeff Ignacio, who is the head of sales ops and marketing ops at Forethought.ai. Jeff is very involved with RevOps Co-op. He's got 
some uh, some courses that he runs for us on RevOps and on sales ops. He's also uh, led RevOps at uh, large companies like Amazon and small growing startups like Upkeep for Thoughts, uh, the ones that he's currently at today. So Jeff, thank you as well for joining us again, my friend. Great to have you. And then last but definitely not least, I have Sarah, who is uh, who leads partner marketing at Vertice. Uh, Vertice is an official partner of RevOps Co-op, and if you haven't checked them out, I definitely think you should. They are uh, certainly a, I'll say, timely product given the current market dynamics. Uh, they essentially exist for two reasons. They're a SaaS purchasing platform that will help you save money on all of your SaaS spend and help you save time on all of your SaaS as well. So Sarah not only uh, brings uh, kind of RevOps and previously she was in marketing ops, so brings a very unique perspective to the table, but also now that she's at Vertice has great insight into how to make the best uh, purchasing decisions and choices for, uh, for your business and for your company. So Sarah, thank you as well for being here. And then the other folks that you see on the screen here are uh, the support team from RevOps Co-op. So they're gonna be keeping an eye on the chat on the Q&A. Uh, and if you need anything, feel free to message them directly. Uh, before I jump in with my first question, we've got the chat open now. It looks like everyone is able to kind of sign in, log in, get access there. Uh, drop questions that you have as we go through this in the chat. There's also a separate Q&A um, function. Feel free to drop questions in there as you want. This is gonna be a interactive, uh, interactive session. We're gonna pull stuff up on the screen as we go but also the panelists will be interacting with folks over chat as we go along too. So please feel free to, uh, to dive in there. All right, so let's get to it. But uh, the way I wanna get started is before we actually talk about, hey, here's how you can build your tech stack and here are all these like great tools and this great technology that you should include in it is I wanna talk about like first, like what is the point of technology in our overall go to market and revenue engine? Like why should we use it? Why does it exist? Um, and then we can get into some of the some of the specifics. So, uh, so Jen, maybe start with you since uh, at least you're the first one I see who's not on mute right now. Uh, so tell me like why, like why- What is like, the point? Why, yeah, what's the whole point of technology with yeah. marketing revenue? Fair enough. Um, I'll take it a maybe a slightly different angle and say anytime as an operator, you're implementing technology or a process, et cetera, you have to know what gap you're filling. And I think that that's um, where I see the best revenue operators are folks that are looking at their entire customer journey and finding out like, where are their gaps either in the customer experience or in my ability to scale beyond the size team that I have. Those are probably good points to look at for either implementing a technology or implementing a new process is you ultimately know what gap you're filling. Um, the idea, and, and we're going to do a little bit of this because everybody wants to see it, but the idea that you need tools because everybody else has them, that's actually most of the requests we get from our clients is like, hey, we heard it's really important to have X as opposed mm -hmm. to saying, hey, we need to uh, fix X, Y, Z. So I think that's a... Um, what I like to see in, in more mature operators is pulling it back to what problem are you solving? What gap are you solving? Yeah. Yeah. And I kind of look at it um, the way I, you know, I was talking to someone this morning when it comes to, to RevOps, I always describe RevOps as the the glue that holds the, the go-to-market function, the revenue engine to, together. Sure. And the way to do that is across people, process, and technology, right? So it's, it's one of those three things that you can do, but you know, that doesn't mean that you should ignore or, or not look at the other two as a solution to problems that, that you're solving. Uh, yeah. Eric, Eric or Jeff, uh, as, you know, revenue operators at growing software uh, kind of companies, um, how do you, what would be your answer to, to that question of, you know, what role does technology play? Um, yeah, it looks like I came off mute first, so I'll, I'll take it. Um, yeah. <laughs> I have a button on my mouse that takes me on and off mute, so it's easy. Um, yeah. So, uh, for me, to kind of just piggyback off of what of, off of what Jen said um, and go uh, in a slightly different direction as well. Um, I think it's it's really important for technology to make things easier. Um, so if you're not not necessarily not always not just saying like what problem what gap am I trying to solve, but how can I make what I'm doing or what the team is doing easier or simpler? If you're implementing you're finding technology that's just too much of a pain, too much of a hassle to one maintain and two to use. Like you're wasting everybody's time, um, and and that's 
aside from just like what gap am I filling? What problem am I solving? That's how I look at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you mind, Matt, if I chime in a little bit? Is that all right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I 100% agree with you, Eric. I think when I think about the gaps or the issues that that clients or customers or you as an operator are bringing up, um, there's definitely like the best ones are just like, hey, there's a customer gap here. That's ultimately going to make you the most money. Awesome. Then there's another one, which is it's hard to prioritize, but there's the scale gaps, which is like, hey, we can't get to the next inflection point unless we do X, Y, Z. The ones that you're talking about are actually my favorite, but they can be red herrings, which are efficiency gaps, right? I can look at it and say, hey, it would be a lot easier or faster to do X, Y, Z. When I started my consulting career at Blue Wolf that got bought by IBM, we used to do rep rides with reps and we used to count their clicks and we'd be like, we're going to get you from 70 clicks to 50. And that was a huge win. But we were also working with giant teams where cool, if I skim off 20 minutes, I've made a huge impact. If I have five reps, 20 minutes in a month, you know, who kind of cares? So I think they're really fun. They're typically easy to fix, but they can be kind of a waste of time. And so usually I like to think about that as like rolling up to one of the other two. So I'm going to prioritize an efficiency gap if it keeps me from scaling because they're putting bad data in, because processes aren't getting adopted. Mm. There's some other reason or because it's creating a customer issue. Not, you know, sometimes you do things for goodwill because you have the go-to-market team on your side and happy, but making sure that we're not just streamlining something, you know, because we want everybody's job to be easier. We're doing it because we want to gather data, because we want to scale the team, because we want to create a good customer experience. Yeah, and I think, and that makes tons of sense, right? We all know that we all have, certainly more than one problem that exists within our go-to-market or revenue engine and all of the potential solutions to all of the potential problems that we do have, you can also you know, kind of stack rank them and they will have different outcomes, right? Or they will drive different outcomes. And, you know, you should prioritize the ones that, you know, will have, you know, balance, you know, impact with, with effort, you know, call it right. And so, yeah, to your point, Jen, if you, you know, if you only got a handful of, of reps and you save three people, 20 minutes each a month, it's like, okay, um, that's different than if you have 300 reps and you save them each 20 minutes a month. So, um, so yeah, Jeff or Sarah, anything to, uh, to add there on the, um, the technology evaluation side? I think Jen and Eric did a nice job of talking about the, the high level why. Um, I think it's important to talk about um, a piece of the how as well. Um, normally what I could do is lay out the customer life cycle um, from a process map perspective. And then start to look at um, what are the capabilities that we use. And what you end up doing is each node along the way of your customer life cycle, you have a spectrum of automation and manual. And what you're, what you're trying to do is come up with um, dissecting each portion of that in a two by two. Consultants love two by twos. Um, so you're thinking about um, the serious decisions called um, relative productivity matrix. Um, on one axis is selling activities, so from internal to direct engagement, um, and then, oh, sorry, selling to non-selling activities, and then down below is internal versus direct engagement. And what you want to do is move to the upper right quadrant where you have a lot of direct selling time, um, and you and you minimize the amount of internal non non-selling activity. And part of that is going to be squishing that down as much as possible within a reasonable. Um, a reasonable, efficient frontier of how many resources you have internally to do so. Um, and so what you're end up doing is by minimizing those clicks, those um, those weight of scrolling, getting access to information as quickly as possible, not having to mine through your entire CRM, but getting to what you need as quickly as possible allows your reps to focus on the highest level of activities. Because when I'm planning with my team for capacity, for the SDRs, for example, we're looking at how many actual minutes do you have in a day to go out and you know dial, and then how are you accessing the numbers and the prospects and the accounts that you need in order to get go out there uh, and make the most of make every minute count. Um, so when you talk about technology, it's about unlocking these capabilities that help you focus on the highest priority things that you need to do from a day to day basis. Yeah, yeah, I like that. And Sarah, I guess. Um... On your side, obviously, you've been or you you know you are on the marketing side. You've also been in marketing operations, but now you obviously you see a bunch of people making software uh, like buying um, decisions. Like, what's your perspective on yeah the role that technology plays there? Well, I think what I was going to say 
a little bit earlier, and it ties back into, I think, Jen's point about the three different tiers is there's technology that helps you get more things done, but then you also have to take into account the customer expectation. So we are publishing a report on sales intelligence tools, for example. And if you looked at that report, most of the companies wouldn't have existed five or 10 years ago. And now it's a list of 50 different software tools that a salesperson should be considering in order to go serve their market. And I think it's it's a matter of we're being asked to do more with less or being asked to do more with the same number of resources. We have more available. We're being asked to cover the globe instead of just our regional market, but also the customers are expecting more of a sales process. They want personalization. They want things that are directed just at them. They don't want, you know, direct mail anymore. So we're just seeing such a wide range of things that people are asking us for because there's such a bigger range of problems that we're being asked to solve with technology rather than just that's not possible. That's not the way we do it. So we we have all of those different options now. Yeah. And uh, and yes, yeah, so I think main thing I'm hearing from uh, the panel is, uh, you know, technology is there to, uh, you know, call it solve problems. Solutions can't come first. Problems come first. And you've got people, process, and technology to, you know, act either independently or together to act as solutions for those those problems. Uh, one of the questions actually that um, uh, I think it was Lindsay in the audience asked was, uh, how do you think about your tech stack in terms of a, a data asset in comparison to uh, to processes? And my initial reaction to that is, I, I think like the technology and Jeff, you brought this up, right? Like map out your, your, your customer journey, you know, look at where you might have uh, kind of gaps, holes, or you need, you know, kind of help to, to support that. And technology should kind of align with that, right? It shouldn't work the other way around. Uh, but I'll just open it up to, you know, the panel again, Jen, Eric, Jeff, Sarah, whoever wants to chime in. Uh, how do you think of that as, you know, it, tech stack as a data asset? And then how does that align or maybe compare to uh, your processes that you have at your company? Happy to chime in with how I'm interpreting this question. Yeah. Um, if I take like a systems thinking point of view and I use systems as like a collection of data, technology and processes, like you're trying to build a system that solves some sort of, you know, issue. And, um, you know, from my perspective, there's this whole other realm, which is like, how do we create a culture of data stewardship? How do we align data together? How do we make that accessible? And that's a whole slew of processes and data sets and technology. I don't know that I can split them. I don't know that I think about them in two different buckets. I think depending on what I'm solving, I'm going to include data sets, processes, technology in a way to solve or create a system. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think now, especially more than ever, that uh, uh, every tool, every system you have is going to be generating data. Data right. should help you make uh, better business decisions and execute on the things that you have. And RevOps practitioners are uniquely positioned to have data across the entire go-to-market engine. And so it is very much, uh, I think, yes, like, you know, your data is an asset and every technology uh, or solution that you have should be supporting that. And that data needs to influence or help uh, leaders within your company make better business decisions faster to help you actually execute, um, you know, drive revenue growth, right? Um, so yeah, makes uh, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, the next uh, next kind of question that I have or things that I wanted to um, to dive into, and Eric, I'll actually ask you this first because you had this um, this experience at DemoStack where. Um, and maybe you can tell us like how big demo stack was when you first joined and what tools you had, but you essentially had the ability to uh, deploy new tools, new technology to actually build that go to market kind of tech stack from the ground up. And so, um, you know, how did you go about that? How did you evaluate uh, the tools? Um, how did you figure out where you might have some of those gaps that you know need a, a technology solution, um, and so so yeah, give us a lowdown on maybe where where DemoStack was at when you started, what you had in place, and then I'll, I'll pull up the mural board uh, that you shared as well, and we can kind of start to to talk through that too. Yeah, so um, 
I was uh, fortunate enough to be a kid in a candy store. I started at Demostack, I think it was employee number 30. So uh, definitely earlier than most RevOps practitioners started a company. Um, we had a, a sales team of like four at the time. So I think when I started, the company had HubSpot for marketing automation and Salesforce, but almost nothing in Salesforce. When I did my first round interviews, I like went into their system, went into Salesforce and it was the cleanest instance of a CRM I've ever seen <laughs> outside of it being blank. So I got really That's excited. That's saying something. <laughs> okay, yeah. I got really, it doesn't look like that anymore. Um, <laughs> yeah, now, but, that you, now that you're there? <laughs> yeah, now that I'm here. Um, it, it, it's quite packed. Um, but, you know, I, I, I did the kind of what Jen and, and Jeff have talked about, which is map out, mapping out the, the customer journey as we had it. Um, and then I, you know, coming from or being at DemoStack, I, I did something a little unique to this world. Um, I wanted to experience as many demos as I could from other companies. So I basically just posted on LinkedIn. I'm willing to take a demo of any company anytime over the next two weeks. And I think over that two weeks, I took about 60 demos of go-to-market technology. Um, it, and I experienced really good ones and really bad ones and found gaps in my process that I didn't know existed. Um, and and found new technology that we've implemented that I didn't know existed as well and solved problems that um, I knew we were going to have as we began to scale. Um, so I, I put this Mira board together just as a kind of a easy representation of kind of what I'm thinking as as the very basics of a scale of a like a growing go to market team. Um, the the technologies that I put in here are less relevant. Um, I just kind of grabbed the top ones and some of the ones that I'm using currently yeah. um, and where they fit or, you know, in the go-to-market kind of team function. Um, so I'm happy to talk through this and, or, or let anybody else on the panel chime in on, on this as well. Yeah. Well, how'd I, so I guess I'm curious. So you said, when you joined Demo Stack, you had sounds like HubSpot and and Salesforce. Uh, what was the like? What was the first thing you went out um, and you know bought after that? Yeah, so lead routing um, was like the first big problem. Um, yeah, we 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 had a, a very manual process and and needed to really up that. So the first thing I went out and bought was uh, lean data. Um, Personally, big fan of lean data. Love it. We to for account mapping, um, lead routing, all of that. Super easy to use and really easy to scale. Um, so bought that, <clears throat> implemented it within my first month. Um, I know I don't have that on where, here, but I would put that. Yeah, in where would the, that? Where would that fit? Would that fit yeah, on here? I would, or is that a different category? I would probably. I would either put it into integrations or CRM. Like it fits natively in Salesforce. You, you, if it's working really well, you never know it's there. Yeah. Or, well, go to market team should never know it's there. Um, <laughs> good operational tech like that we manage. I, I see as like you know, the CIA. Like if they're doing their job, you never know they're there. If it's yep. breaking, you know they're there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, so that's the first thing. The first thing I bought, and then the second thing I bought was actually uh, an analytics tool, um, so I could start measuring and mapping. And Matt, you are part of that journey as well. Um, yeah. I believe that was number two. Uh, so that upgraded our Salesforce instance so that we could take advantage of uh, more automation um, in the sales process. And then the second thing we bought, or the third thing we bought was data and intent. So we could do live enrichment, um, for all of our inbounds. Uh, we actually bought, uh, another tool that's not on this list, but currently using revenue base. Um, mm -hmm. and if you, I won't make too many shameless plugs, but if you haven't heard of them, take a look, they're amazing. Unbelievable. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. So it sounds like, you know, again, the progression was you're like, all right, what's the most painful problem that we're experiencing today? It sounds like lead routing was one of those things for you. I'm guessing that is probably may not be the case for everyone, but you're like, all right, that's the first thing that 
we have to go out and solve. And then the second thing, which, uh, you know, I know we worked on early on was, hey, we need to be able to understand uh, like what's actually happening across my go-to-market engine. And so you need some form of uh, analytics in order uh, in order to do that. And then you moved on to the um, to the data and uh, the intense side. Um, so I guess like Jen, Jeff, Sarah, like in uh, like from your you know kind of RevOps perspective, I guess I'm curious on your take on uh, like the way that Eric uh, kind of laid this out. And then you know what are some things that you might add or you know even approach differently or the same uh, yeah. that you just heard. Um, I can share um, a tech stack that I previously managed as well. It's more of a data flow um, view yeah. as opposed to um, customer lifecycle and capability uh, viewpoint. Um, so let me pull this up. Uh, this is actually from the, the course that we teach here at RevOps Co-op uh, called Unleashing ROI. Um, but this is a data flow uh, map. So this specific company was looking to um, match their customer data um, in a number of different ways. Um, so first free trials um, and looking at a freemium model, trying to do an A-B test of which uh, PLG motion was going to make the most, side, most, most sense. Then secondly was tying in the customer data um, at the user level and at the account level in order to create a customer health score. Um, that would allow us to um, uh, minimize our variance for our predictions or around our renewal scores. Um, and also um, charge for overages because believe it or not, a lot, uh, believe it or not, some companies have overages and they don't they don't collect the revenue from their customers. Um, so the interesting thing is when I jumped into this business, um, there were a number of different tools already on the marketing and the um, sales side of the house. So the acquisition stack was 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 fairly good, um, but it was that entire you know post sales motion that was um, that was really nascent. Everything was running in spreadsheets within the business. Um, they were missing deadlines on the renewals. And so we started to um, build up the technical muscle at the top right. Um, so really getting to our product production database, mirroring it and getting access to it to, through a series of ETL and reverse ETL tools that allowed us to create a flywheel effect around a data lake. Um, and part of that is you know working with your data science or your product teams to get a handle um, on those data flows and matching you know different unique IDs together. Um, but in reality, you know, what we're trying to do is just get better insights so that we can drive better decisions at all layers of the organization, right? So as we're planning, uh, this is a SaaS-based business, you know, the, the tighter we can get our net recurring revenue over 100%, um, the, the less pressure, then the more pressure it takes off of the sales team for the year. Um, so we built this entire stack probably within three, uh, three months. Um, the negotiating for all the tools and the budget took another three months. So on the front end, this was a six-month process. Um, but it was also a unique opportunity for the team that I managed because that, you know, they came from classic systems administrations backgrounds. They didn't really have a strong SQL or kind of a, a data eng background. Um, so mm -hmm. those were the skills that I helped, um, I helped layer on to their tool belt. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was a unique learning opportunity for, for the revenue operations team. Uh, but yeah, this is just one such view to support kind of a, um, a hybrid coverage model. This was an inbound, outbound, partner-led, and a PLG level motion. Um, and it all sort of kind of started humming together um, after about a year. That's great. And I wasn't able to get through counting, but I think there was, what, I mean, 25, 30 different tools, uh, or at least uh, kind of uh, uh, vendors, providers on there. So. Um, yeah, let's just say we had a combination <laughs> of vendors, um, full-time staff, uh, to yep. manage. Um, I would say the level of fidelity in terms of like how well many of those tools were run. Um, we kept like those tier one systems uh, under lock and key with the revenue operations teams. Um, and some of the other teams had um, lower layers of support. Yep. Yep. That's great. Um, so, uh, so Sarah, I'm going to ask you about the proliferation of tools, especially across go to market because uh but before i do that uh i guess jen i'm curious now so you've seen eric's point of view on uh kind of building uh building from the the ground up uh we kind of have seen jess as well uh i'm curious about yours now especially because right a lot of your enterprise uh kind of SaaS companies uh that are, are customers of yours uh you know like the twilios of the world mm -hmm. and everybody um you know like what's uh what do you see maybe from them and then you know even if you could you know correct or you know maybe reverse some of the problems that you've either seen from in or that you've helped them unwind yourself at go nimbly 
uh, like, yeah, what's your take on the, the ideal kind of tech stack? And I'll pull up, I'm going to pull up the visual that you shared I've got um, it here. with me as well. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, go ahead and so, you want to go ahead and share. I think the, the first thing I would kind of say is um, the biggest issue that enterprise level customers are having is that we have a lot of tech and data silos. It's, you know, we've worked a lot on the people silos. There's a lot of content around unifying sales and marketing and CS and getting a unified strategy, but actually getting all those tools and those data sets to talk to each other is a really big project. And, and it's a little bit teasing. What I've got is somewhere between what Eric showed and what Jeff showed, which is, um, you know, we're going to look ultimately at first at you know, left to right, what are all the processes, all the things that I've got to get done all the way from, you know, a customer's aware of me till they're an advocate. I yeah. just kind of brainstormed a few things that I might be solving, right? We've got all the lead handoff and lead scoring. We've got nurturing here and that can turn into all these tools, whatever you might choose. Uh, you know, here's a, a sample tech stack you might be dealing with and they're all solving a variety of these things. But Ultimately, you now have to integrate all these things. And what I find is the biggest issue in a tech stack is that a lot of these are standalone. They're not integrated. We're using 20% of the features and we're not getting the value out of it. I've done a lot of uh, outreach to sales loft and then sales loft to outreach. And it's like, well, we're whatever tool you've got there. And there are pros and cons to both, but you're utilizing 20% of the features every single time going back and forth between the two. And yeah. so, you know, getting to a point where you're actually utilizing those things and a lot of the, the power comes in actually integrating them into your tech stack. I won't go too much into this because Jeff kind of did, but hey, you've got options for how you might do that, right? You're integrating your tech stack either through a reverse ETL, which basically, you know, pushing data from your data warehouse back to go to market systems and making sure that everything's connected, some, you know. Whether you get a customer data platform, whether you do that custom, there's a million you know ways to slice this. Or if you go more kind of the iPaaS integration product as a service, and you get that you know kind of data can go anywhere to anywhere. Workado is one that comes up a lot. But basically, yeah. how do we get all of these data sets talking to each other? So ultimately, we can get that one view of the customer. We can you know do really robust reporting on our funnel. What's really keeping us from doing that is we don't have data sets connected. We don't have tables connected. And therefore we're all dealing with like lead to contact tables, but in every single tool. So yeah. that's, you know, my TLDR. The only other additional thing I would look at is when you're looking at, you know, whether you're going to use your current tech stack, you're going to move all to one, like, you know, maybe a CRM or a big single platform, or you're going to use a bunch of different platforms. Uh, don't worry about what this visual says. I just wanted to show like map it, what kind of functionality, what kind of cost, what kind of time is it going to take to implement? What's the risk here? And if you can do bonus points, like what's the maintenance that something's going to take that might help you choose between solutions. Yeah, that's great. And I think the thing I'll, uh, I think the thing that, uh, you know, I'll say too, that I, I've seen across kind of everything is like one, um, like done is done is better than perfect. Right. So in like, in that example, Jen, that you just mentioned of like, like just assign some points and like do it manually, right? Like you don't need to come up with some really complex scoring model that you think about for four weeks, sure. you know, in order to do that, right? But like, you know, done is better than, um, done is better than perfect. And then I think the thing that I also saw across all three of your, uh, your kind of visuals was, you know, essentially mapping against the, uh, like the customer, the customer journey um, or the end-to-end, the -end, you know, kind of revenue engine, go-to-market engine. So I think, those are probably things that everyone on this on this call can start to do today if they haven't is just like you know go from top to bottom left to right and lay out you know your your customer journey again done is better than perfect don't overthink it and then map the the tools uh, that you currently have against those things and you know see where you might have gaps see where you might have a lot of overlap right and all of a sudden maybe you have like duplicating uh, duplicate functionality, um, and you're spending money on, you know, like two tools that can essentially do the same thing. And so before I get into, uh, cause I want to also talk about like some common pitfalls for, uh, uh, for like making technology buying decisions and things like that. But Sarah, from a, um, like a buying perspective, you know, I guess one, I'm curious on your reaction to seeing like 25, 30 different tools on, uh, you know, like these, these visuals, like how does that compare to what you know about, 
some of your customers at um, at Vertice. And then, you know, when you think about like, we actually need to buy these tools. And Jeff actually talked about a little bit with, you know, like, hey, there's a negotiation process, there's a, a procurement process. You know, what are some things that RevOps folks can also consider, especially given the market conditions today that, you know, like how can they get the best deal? How can they make sure they aren't buying two tools that can essentially do the same thing? Like what are some of those things from a procurement process that could be useful for, for the audience? So to answer your first question, in terms of what we typically see, we are actually seeing about 80 tools, 80 plus tools across organizations. Now, obviously that's covering other other feature or other functions as well, but we're seeing, you know, 80 to 100 tools that are just supporting an organization. So I'm not at all surprised by seeing 25 just on one slide of, you know, these are the things that we need to start with. In terms of helping with procurement, I would say if you are lucky enough to have a RevOps professional that also loves to detail things out and keep track of all of their tools, then you are in good company. But there are a lot of companies that maybe know in theory what they have, or they have one person that kind of has it all in their brain, but most people don't have like a documentation of these are all of the tools that we have, and these are all of the features that are included in there, and these are all of the teams that have access to those tools. So step one is just doing like a full inventory of what you have, what features it, it covers, and then who has access to it, and if you're using the right number of licenses. That is going to help you one, identify where you have gaps, where you have overages, and then also is going to be helpful for leverage. So one thing that we talk about a lot is when you're going into contract negotiations with these different vendors, they know who their competitors are. They know the levers that they can push and pull. So it's important for you to know who the competitors are to your number one tool as well. And if there are any levers that you could push and pull there. So, um, you know, things like giving yourself plenty of time to go and negotiate. The salesperson knows if you are desperate to buy that thing that they've kind of got you in a corner. And so giving yourself time to go and negotiate is always going to be your number one. Um, having, you know, Eric, you said you went and got a bunch of demos. If you have that where you can say that you're looking at all of the different alternatives and you know what the different um, contract terms are and what the different prices are, that's really going to help you as well. And then being able to, yeah, look at your tech stack, see if you already have the functionality internally. Can you use that or can you at least use that as leverage to say, you know, we already have this functionality in X tool. So this is something that would be beneficial, but we could cover that gap if we needed to. That will maybe make them a bit more eager. There are plenty of negotiation tips. I don't pretend to be an expert on them, but um, I know that at least knowing your options helps you in negotiations. Yeah. That's great. And I think the, um, at least having a starting point of the inventory is important because again, heard it from Eric before with some of these tools, if they're doing their job, you don't know that they exist, right? Like if lead routing is working, you're not supposed to know that there's, you know, a, a tool or a vendor, um, you know, that's, that's behind that. Uh, Eric does, right. But the, you know, the, the salesperson who, who gets those leads doesn't. And so, uh, but the moment something breaks, that's when, you know, people run to folks like, Eric and and Jeff and are like you know hey can you fix Salesforce um, but uh, uh, but separate from that um, so yeah important to document uh, you know at least have a an inventory somewhere um, of the tools that 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 you're using and then yeah even mapping those tools against you know call it the functionality the features that you get um, again some sort of spreadsheet matrix if you don't have it today like do that uh, that can help you see where you might have overlap with certain features that can help you go and negotiate better terms if you want to keep both it can also help you be like hey scratch the um you know scratch the stuff that uh you know we're not you know we're not using right like why do we have calendly when we also have you know hubspot meeting functionality as one example um you know those are some things to consider so uh so good stuff and then obviously there's you know software that can help you manage SaaS like Vertice. so there's uh you know plenty of options in terms of scaling that as well um so yeah. now i want to yep go ahead Jen. i have one quick thing just to we were talking about how we document all these tools i'm happy to share it I, I think i don't know how to make so that all of you can copy this but we have an air table like where we manage this and you know this isn't going to help you negotiate better terms but it can at least help you um see what tools you've got and yeah. you know 
this is pretty robust, but you can make your own version where it's like, okay, track all your tools. You can map them to like what teams are actually using it. Get yourself an owner. What's the purpose? You can even do core processes. So if you want to put like what's involved in lead handoff, lead routing, ABM, like all the core things that help you get something done, give it a status. Like, hey, are you keeping it? Is it core? Do you want to review it? Do you want to consider deprecation? What's your annual cost, frequency, et cetera? You can then, you know, kind of have your contract terms in here so that you know when your mm -hmm. renewals are coming up. And it's got, you know, Airtable has fun little interfaces. So you could actually like share this across the company with like procurement teams, et cetera, and say like, all right, here's Salesforce. What teams use it? Are we getting rid of it, et cetera? Here's outreach. Okay. And so it doesn't help you with every single decision, but at least, you know, what tools you're using. You're not having the thing that Sarah said where it's like, how many tools you use? Well, we think 20. And then you realize you've got yeah. shelfware somewhere. Yeah. Shadow yeah, IT. That's, cool. that's what we always see is they don't know that they bought something or some right. other team has an exact duplicate. And you're like, why are we paying double for this? Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Jeff, did you have a, uh, do you have something to add? Yeah. I dropped in the chat a template. Uh, it's a role access technology matrix. It's a useful tool as you're building your, um, your onboarding workflow with your IT team, but you're also using it for um, insight into who should have app access. And then you can start doing a cost per month per user for different roles in the organization that helps you um, define your unit economics from a technology perspective for particular roles within the business as well. Um, but one of the things that I think about procurement, right? It's, um, you know, there's no better time today for cost for a RevOps team than for to drive bundles right? Many of the vendors probably in the long run in the next couple of years are going to acquire, um, uh, they're going to acquire um, these companies and roll them in as features for the entire business. Um, and the second thing is um, you can drive good enough, cap good enough functionality for some of these tail end features and just go with a bundle. So for example, uh, recently I started um, rolling in uh, Clary and Wingman because we had a separate um, revenue intelligence solution, but we started driving better pricing across the board for these bundle solutions. Um, second was um, HubSpot. HubSpot Sales Hub was another awesome feature for us because we were able to get decent enough like Chili Piper-like functionality. As much as I love Chili Piper, HubSpot was able to, for us to, to enable some of that round robin capability features. And so we just started looking at the, the landscape of what we were spending on and said, these point solutions, where can we bundle? Where can we start to break down these unit economics? Because customers, uh, your vendors today are trying to lock in renewals early. Um, and so in exchange for that early renewal, you know, I, I want to pound the flesh, right? Like how, where, where can I, where can I extract some gains in, in an equal partnership between us and the vendor? Um, and then the second thing that I would say is when, whenever you're thinking about your functionality, um, write your requirements down um, and don't write your requirements down in a vacuum, like work with your stakeholders and say, here, what are the top five things you absolutely need? Because not every vendor can fulfill that entire feat, that, 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 um, that surface area of those features. And so once you get a, a landscape of what specific tools are capable, you can then walk into your, your vendor um, conversations or demos knowing what you want, right? And you don't have to be sold something from an SDR or a rep. You already know what you're looking for, right? And that just makes you a much more informed buyer. And that's the power of buying today than say maybe 15 years ago when we were buying software. Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, the things there, and I think I heard this from other folks too, is like, yeah, right. You know, first of all, there's always these cycles, right? There's like, you know, the great bundling and then the great unbundling. And now we're going to the great bundling um, again. But what I will say is someone who, um, you know, has now uh, like, you know, I've started multiple companies, whether you uh, and I've led like multiple teams, this exists like the more, the more people that you have on a team, the more technology solutions that you have within your tech stack, the more unnecessary complexity you are going to have, right? If you have a bunch of people, uh, you just have more points of contact, right? Like more, more times you need to potentially communicate the, the same thing. So you better make sure that every person, you know, like has a, a, a job to be done, right? Is adding value. Same thing with the technology stack. And the thing that you said, Jeff, that uh, really resonated was like, yeah, where can you get 
you know, like good enough, like solid uh, functionality, even if, the, if it doesn't give you like 100% of what you need, like what's the, what's the point of, um, you know, like kind of value to get you over that, that cliff, over that hump? And, you know, can you get there with something like your marketing automation tool, if that's HubSpot, you know, by the sales hub, like I mentioned my own example of like Calendly versus HubSpot meeting functionality, you know, like we're going through all that, um, that stuff ourselves. And I think for all of us who are in RevOps at, software companies, like keep in mind that all those same business conversations that we're having internally are the same things that our, our vendors are having as well. So like Jeff said, go and like negotiate for an early renewal. If you know that like you can kind of roll, you know, some functionality from a point solution into a tool that is obviously a must have, you know, like use those things to, to your advantage. Just keep in mind that those things that you're experiencing right now, those exist on the other side too. Um, and so let's see, we've got 15 minutes left. I want to handle uh, kind of two things in the last uh, like 10, 15 minutes. Uh, one is uh, the first one is uh, let's talk about pitfalls um, or uh, kind of mistakes when it comes to one, either buying new technology or two, uh, let's also use the example, Jeff, that you just gave of like, hey, we want to eliminate a point solution so that we can kind of drive uh, like at the same sort of functionality from maybe a current provider that's already in our stack. What are some common mistakes or, uh, you know, kind of uh, errors that you've seen people, customers, uh, companies make in the past that, you know, folks here can, uh, can avoid? I know two of the things I think one Jen I heard from you was um, uh, the implementation, either one, you're only partly implementing things or two, you're not leveraging the full feature set. And I think Jeff, it was you that mentioned uh, like actually documenting, understanding what your requirements are, but curious, first off, Jen, Jeff, if you have anything to add to that, and then curious for, you know, Sarah and Eric as well, like what are some things that you've seen that might be, you know, common mistakes, pitfalls that people make? I think just knowing maintenance, maintenance costs are real. Um, one more tool means another tool to manage. And so making sure that that's incorporated into your analysis, I mean, that's one. And then the other one, I think, you know, RevOps teams in general have to keep in mind that as you centralize operations, like we saw it when IT got centralized, like you can become slower. And so just keep in mind that like, we want to move at a fast speed. We also want to protect our tech stack and protect our data. And so finding the right balance of allowing teams to, implement the tools that they need and move quickly with what you centralize. You sometimes have to figure out like, all right, Salesforce, I'm owning it. I'm keeping the door shut. Like, this is really important, but maybe there are places where you can let go a little bit more because speed is still really important. That might lead to two different teams using two different tools. You might make the choice to allow that to happen. Just be intentional about it. It's like, if I intentionally allow, you know, two teams to use two different tools because it's just not worth my time right now and allows them to move faster and reach a milestone, that's okay. So uh, yeah, keeping in mind intentionality when you're making those choices and making sure that for the sake of great process and great management that we're not slowing down the business. Yeah. Uh, pitfalls. Um, wow, I've made so many in my career. Um, how how <laughs> yeah. do I count the ways of Ditto. regrets? Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, let's see, I, I, let's go over a couple of mistakes. Um, we won't trade war stories here. They'll just make me cry. Um, the first one is, um, buying a tool, uh, buying a tool or selecting a vendor because someone else said so, um, like that's just like mistake. Number one, it's just like following the herd. Um, number two is, uh, not mapping out your requirements up front, right? Like you are, uh, I need this tool yesterday. I need it now. I need it across the entire org. And there's just so much pressure coming in from the business. Um, you just need to start stiff arming your leaders and um, give you, give yourself some breathing room, right? Um, and start creating a work backwards plan. A work backwards plan is like, here are my vendors, here are the roll-off dates. And here's when I'm going to start assessing the capability and whether it's redundant, um, meets the parity that I need, or it should be replaced or complemented with something else. Um, so those are the, that's the thing is uh, take the time to be a leader and uh, make set a plan right? Um, you're going to sunset, replace, augment different things along the way. Uh, the third is uh, not investing in your people um, enough, right? Um, and so 
you can often you can often bring in um, a tool and then you have a mismatch in skill set right you have someone who's been in marketo for 10 years and then you are in pardot and you're like well okay well they're kind of the same they, they, they can they can figure it out and you're like all right well this person needs to get up to like level 10 speed in 30 days so it's like well that's not going to happen right um so those are those are things that i think are huge um fourth is um sometimes it's okay not to buy a tool um like it's okay. Like if you need to have a <laughs> manual workflow for a while, because it's priority number 19 for the company, like solve problem number one. Like, you know, when you think about a hose and it's, it's got these kinks in it, you don't unlock the last knot, you unlock the first knot. So, you know, like prioritize, prioritize where you should be problem solving. Yeah. Yeah. I think two, two things there that uh, resonated. One is like, yeah, uh, start. I mean, everything, every problem you have, like the first solution should always be what can I do like right now to, to get this thing done. And I'll actually say hundred percent of the time, that is not going to be like you using some tool or piece of technology to get it done. Right. It's going to mean, let me write something out in a spreadsheet in Airtable. Let me use Zapier to do a thing, right. Like, you know, figure out how to uh, do it manually first. And then the other thing um, I know when I was leading BizOps RevOps uh, in a prior life uh, was, yeah, all these teams, uh, you know, kind of wanted, software to do a thing right and you know the thing that i always um asked when they came to me was like ask questions right but like ask helpful questions right so for us we had okrs so i remember there's a marketing leader who came to me and was like hey gotta like i need sendoso you gotta sign this contract because we gotta send out like a bunch of gifts or whatever right and i was like oh, okay um like well just like can you tell me like first help me understand this like what okr do we have this quarter where like, where that's going to like, this is going to help us move the needle. Right. And like all of a sudden that started to impact a lot of things of like, Oh yeah, that's not really one of our objectives for this quarter. And so we probably don't need to lock ourselves into a $20,000 12 month agreement for gifting platform for like one, one use case that we have where we want to run once a year. Um, so like just ask questions. Right. And yeah, the other thing that can always really help with that, Jeff, that you mentioned is like, if you have call it a standard process where it's like, hey, you know, just like the way we do things here is you got to document requirements for like any new tool that we want, right? So if someone comes to you and is like, hey, I needed this yesterday, be like, oh, can you like, can you help me complete the requirements document? Like, you know, it's just a, it's it's required. We got to do it. Like, we need the documentation. All those things can really, really help you. So, um, so Eric, curious if you have any. Uh, you know, call it a, I mean, I know you're like mostly perfect and you, you know, you don't make mistakes, but if you got anything to share or add there, and then uh, I've got one last question for, for Sarah before we wrap up. Oh boy. Made, made too many pitfalls to count. Um, <laughs> I, I think, I think uh, uh, kind of the, the don't buy, don't buy because you're told to um, a similar version of that is um, swap deals. Um, I think swap deals, at least mm. for, um, us has been some uh, pretty hot topic um, and just signing the contract because we needed to in order for them to sign our contract uh, that that made that mistake uh, once or twice here and um, it's caused more issues than uh, it solved for for me at least um, so don't feel pressure uh, from you know your, your go to market team your sales team to um, evaluate or sign a deal just because it's going to help them. Yep. That's great. And, uh, and so the last, uh, we've got a few minutes um, here to wrap up. So uh, I guess Sarah, from your perspective, again, like going back to uh, kind of procurement and, and buying of these things, like what are some things as you, you know, kind of talk to customers or look at a bunch of your customers, like maybe what are some problems that you've seen them make in the past or even what are some problems that they might have, which is why they even like, come to you for a potential solution in Vertice? Like, what are those things that you're seeing out there across, um, you know, your own customer base? So the number one thing that we see is a lack of time. And I think it kind of goes back to a, a, a point that a lot of people have made is that we have a problem and we need to solve it yesterday. And so the instinct is just, just sign the contract. Like, I need this thing, I need it now. I don't really care how much it, it costs you know, we can see the ROI of it. And so you'll sign a contract without really thinking about, are you getting a good deal on that contract? Are you paying the right price for that contract? Are you 
thinking about how it's going to serve you in a year or two years from now. It's just kind of, you see that problem, you feel that pain. And so you, you're willing to do whatever it takes in order to rid yourself of that. So it's mostly time. And then it ends up costing more or you lock yourself into a contract for three years when really two years would have been a better fit for you. So what we really try to do is take that step back. Um, it's a little bit like the process, right? Where you ask for that list of requirements. We take the step back and we just ask, are you sure two years is the right fit for you? Maybe a one-year contract is better or you know, you're planning on growing to a hundred people instead of 50 people in the next year. Do you have a tool that's gonna support that? And thinking about it in, yes, we wanna solve that short-term pain, but also, the long term. Um, and then my own personal pitfall that I did want to mention is actually buying a tool to fix an organizational problem and thinking that by, you know, buying X, it's going to solve the fact that you don't communicate well with whatever the other team is when really it's it's probably just a human problem that you should be discussing. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, um, yeah, don't overlook the fact that, um, you know, technology is a, a a solution or a potential solution. It's not the only solution, and typically, it's not the only thing that is going to help solve that problem. So, uh, mm -hmm. so yeah, that makes uh, makes tons of sense. Um, let's see. We had two. Uh, we had a couple of other questions kind of pop up that I'll throw out there first. Jen, thank you for sharing that air, air table link, and Jeff for sharing your um, your sheet as well. I guess let's. Um, Let's round out with, uh, I guess one question was, um, and Jeff, you kind of answered this with publishing a roadmap, but yeah, how do you prioritize uh, kind of some of these different initiatives and stay transparent, communicate timelines, and maybe even push back um, across your, your leadership on the RevOps side? Let's do like maybe 30 seconds each. Like Jeff, we'll start, start with you on, the, on that question since you responded, I know. Uh, start with goals, um, goals of the business. Uh, publish a roadmap, and then have an um, have an effort impact uh, matrix that allows you to prioritize, uh, calibrate, uh, and then do a bottoms up uh, capability and um, capacity model for your ops team. And believe it or not, you may not be able to actually complete the project because you just don't have enough hours across your team to complete strategic project X. So and fourth, um, if that's if that's the case, uh, force trade offs. Yeah, I like it. Tie it to goals. Be transparent have some sort of decision-making framework. So Eric, what about you? How do you prioritize? Exactly the same way. <laughs> um, I like it. Yeah. It, there it, you go. It's setting. <laughs> yeah. I have nothing to add. <laughs> yeah. Hey, so, I mean, that's a, uh, that's an answer all in itself. We've got two great RevOps leaders here doing things the, the same way. Uh, you know, probably, uh, probably a good reason why maybe the rest of us should try some of those things. And Jen, what about, what about you? Um, I agree. I'll just give a framework that you can layer on top. The example that came up in the question is how do you deal with like two important things? It's very easy to prioritize like, hey, this is a strategic project. This is not. The hard part is when two things are very important. There's yep. something called an even overstatement. And then you have to like basically have two things that are both really important. How do you prioritize between those two? So I might say uh, renewals even over new business. Both are really important, but if I have that, that lets me choose and that lets me tell back the business, hey, we all agree these are the even overstatements. That's what I'm using to prioritize. And then you don't have to have a meeting every single time. You have your yeah. kind of framework to, to go and say because, um, you know, everything's a priority now. And interesting fun fact, the word priorities was not in like literature in, until the 1940s. Like you oh, wow. only see it spike in books. It's like, industrial revolution, like everything's important. We can do it all at once. And that makes it impossible to actually choose anything. So trying to teach the business that like a priority is singular and we do have to stack rank things. Yep. I like that. I personally, we do OKRs every quarter, uh, try to tie everything back to OKRs. We're also flexible on like if stuff does pop up in the middle of the quarter and we're like, oh, you know what? Um, this is actually more important than the stuff that we thought was going to be important at the beginning of the quarter we should change, right? Have flexibility there. But yeah, you got to have like some North Star that can, that you can look at that can allow you to say, we got to do this over this. Uh, and then Sarah, what about, what about you? I'm not going to pretend like I have a better idea than that, but I do love the even over. So I will probably add that in as well. If, if everything is a priority, nothing is a priority. So um, exactly. really talking about that. Yep. That's great. 
All right, y'all. So we are at time. We are at top of the hour. I want to thank all of our panelists for joining and participating in the discussion today. This was a very fun conversation. So thank you all. I also learned a ton. Um, lots of things that I'm going to steal. Uh, everyone in the audience who uh, participated, uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Thank you very much for the questions as well. After uh, Afterwards, uh, us and the folks at Vertice will be uh, following up with all registrants and attendees. We'll make sure you all get uh, like the links for a lot of the things that we shared, some other visuals, uh, stuff like that. And then um, in probably a week or two, this session will be recorded. We'll include a summary of it, put it up on our website. So you'll have some uh, kind of evergreen content that y'all can reference. But until, uh, until next time, again, thank you, everybody. I will let you go and I will see you all on the flip side. So take care, everyone.